Hey everyone, welcome to episode 11 of the North Wing Project. I'm out here checking out the project as it is. Got my son Jacob here trying to break cement. <laughs> so as you can see behind me, we've got walls. We've got foundations and we got walls. Super excited concrete. So enjoy this B-roll of concrete real quick. jump inside. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I made some of these changes that we uh, did to adjust for ledge. So if you remember in the previous video I mentioned that we had to move the footprint over six inches so that means this whole concrete shifted six inches. I'm going to show you how I did that in Revit right now. In principle it seems simple right it's just take everything and move it over six inches. Those of you who have been using Revit as long as I have uh, know that it's not that simple right. You've got all these elements that are hosted. I've got all of the structure modeled right. There's a lot of a lot of things that could break when you're just moving something six inches. So I had a decision to make. So what I wanna do is just sort of walk you through the process because I know you guys may have run into this or have thought about this or maybe gone through the same um, thought process in your mind about uh, making a change like this. I am maintaining an as-built model um, for this project. Again, I am the general contractor, I am the owner, I'm the architect, and I am, I am doing some of the labor work out there. So there's a lot of benefits to me doing that. In this scale and this type of work, you may not actually be maintaining that. The problem in some cases is that uh, when you start moving things in the field and there's no maintenance of that or involvement with the architect, then you know, things can get a little hairy. And what I'm going to show you is actually not just the process and the technical side of moving something six inches, but entire part of a building, but also on the design end as an architect looking at this, what that happened or what that did to the design of this project. Um, this is where the model stands um, as it is today. I'll spin around a little bit. Those with the keen eye may notice a couple things. They may notice that there's actually a door back here. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, <laughs> and uh, and you might not notice it, but there is a six inch difference right here. Why can't I just select everything? So first of all, this is phase. So if I if I switch this to um, show previous uh, plus new, you'll see it is phase. So I could say, all right, show show only new. And technically, right, technically that's all the stuff that's moving six inches. The problem is, and as you guys all probably know, you know things like doors, walls, windows. Those those will move pretty easily, right? Um, but things like structural beam systems and maybe hosted families and wall hosted families or face space families or whatever these families are in here may not move. Um, I could unconstrain everything, but then what would happen? Well, if I wanted to print a set of drawings from this, if I go to the first floor plan here, if I wanted to print a set of drawings, I, I would venture to say that a lot of these dimensions and tags and notes and so on um, would probably get deleted if I unconstrained everything. So I want to maintain this because I do want to be able to print a updated set of drawings if I wanted to, uh, as well as use them for potentially building and, and, and coordinating other things. So I had a decision to make, how was I going to do this? And so what I decided to do, which is not always right in every project, um, in this case it is right. This is a project where the site file exists in the architectural file, which is not always the case. I don't really have much care for a shared coordinate system or an origin or anything really, because it's it's in no relation to anything other than itself. So I'm not giving too too much care about that. And so what I actually decided to do on this one is take the entire existing and move that six inches instead of the new. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but the reason for that is I'm okay breaking all of the annotations and text and dimensions from phase one of this job, if they still even existed in this model, but it maintained everything for phase two. So what I did is pretty much the opposite of what you're seeing here, which is what, instead of saying show new, which again, this is show new. If I flip this thing to um, show previous phase, here's all the existing. I basically selected everything here and I moved that six inches in right? The opposite direction. So whatever, whatever direction we were shifting, you get the idea. Um, and so that, that allowed me to shift things. And as you can see, I'm happy to report that I think only one or two dimension strings even broke. Um, and they didn't even get deleted. I think they just removed one of their, one of their pieces. So, so that's kind of what I did here. I think it's going to be different in every case, you know, and your projects are going to be different too, but it's interesting as Revit uses, I'm sure it's an interesting d dilemma for you to think about. It seems like such a simple thing. Yeah, let's shift the whole whole footprint six inches. But then it's like, oh, how do I do that in, in, in Revit, right? Um, so then on the design side, what did that do? And, and uh, those with the keen eye again would may have noticed that um, the first floor plan looks a little different. And so what happened here is, and you'll also notice um, 
I have these blue dimensions. So these blue dimensions are what I'm calling my as built or construction dimensions. And so I'm using those to sort of help um, manage and, and look at, um, you know, different things and, and, and tell different stories um, separate from the old, the original construction document dimensions, so to speak. What happened is uh, this dimension and this dimension obviously changed because this fireplace in the middle stays, right? So even though this footprint only shifted six inches, a couple things happened here. This fireplace was a little less square than I originally thought, especially when we dug down a little bit. Um, so these dimensions weren't exactly where I wanted, I thought they were anyways. Um, and plus it moved six inches. This dimension increased pretty pretty significantly compared to this one. So this, this shrunk quite a bit. So I lost space in a closet, which, what do I care? There's, a, there's another closet in there and it's my closet anyways, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and but I gained quite a bit of space in this in this primary bath side of things. This is actually almost a complete redesign. The only the, the shower, the tub and the toilet stayed the same. If you look at previous videos, you'll notice it. Um, but what I did is I actually I actually increased the size of the bathroom. So I moved the wall, but I actually pulled back this this wall. I gave it a nice two by six for a wet wall, which I wanted to do anyways. But by shifting by shifting it down and moving and sort of going through this process of now having this sort of entrance through the walk-in closet and, and make you know making this a little leaner over here what i was able to do is actually get a a much larger vanity which is one of the things that that we really wanted so this is a seven foot wide vanity um a an area for linens which is something i really wanted and and have a little bit more space in between here as well as a little more space in the walk-in closet so if you compare this to the first one, um, it's not dramatically changed. Uh, there's, there's, the walls are pretty much similar quantity and material wise, it didn't change all that much, um, but it actually made it to me a, a much, I, li I like the design better. And so it's one of those things where it's interesting, um, you know, in all cases, not all cases, you know, you, you'll, you'll want to redesign from a shift like this, but because that dimension expanded so much, it actually created such an opportunity um, that, that I had to take advantage of it. Right. And so that's what it did. I took advantage of it. So that is how I moved this foundation wall over six inches in order to try not to run into this little ledge here. Now I'm going to show you a little bit about um, how I am doing my best to uh, coordinate the location of these anchor bolts. It seems like a silly thing, right? And as an architect, it's something you never really think about, let's be honest. Um, so, you know, looking up the code for anchor bolt locations is something that I may not reference all the time. And so um, that was something that I, I re-referenced a little bit. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, for me, it's 12 inches from corners and then no more than six feet apart, whatever. One of the things that is nice and cool about this project as the designer, contractor, architect, all of the above, is that I have, and, and actually framing, I'm planning on framing this myself, is that I have the ability to do this, right? I can I can pres prescribe where I want these to be based on an intuition of, of maybe what the framer is gonna do, but unless you know how they're gonna do a layout, it's kind of hard to, to coordinate these. And so what I'm trying to do is miss studs, right? There's nothing worse than having an anchor bolt and then a stud laying on top of it from the foundation. And so the way I did this um, is, is I've modeled all the framing, as you guys may know from the previous videos, right? So I've modeled all the, even the studs. Um, and what I did is I spent the time to determine how I wanna do layout. So where am I gonna pull layout from? So I'm gonna pull layout from basically this corner, um, this corner that way. Um, you know, the existing house, I'm not considering that to be square, even though it may be square enough, but I'm basically, I wanna keep everything within the new and then whatever's left over over here is 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 what it is. I mean, we're gonna be doing some crazy furring and, and stuff to make this clean anyways against the existing. Um, so basically I took this corner and said, okay, every single wall that's going in this direction, right, needs to be 16 inches on center starting from the outside face of this stud, right? So that means this wall, this wall, this wall. And so um, if you look straight down on this, right, these are all, these are all gonna line up. And then same in this direction. So from this corner this way, every single wall, um, no matter where it is in the project, is gonna be 16 inches on center starting from that corner. Um, so not only will they, the, the studs line up from floor to floor, depending on where they land, but also it lets me determine now that is the prescription or yeah, prescription, I guess, <laughs> um, for where these anchor bolts are gonna be. And so you can see we have an opening here and now um, here's all my anchor bolts. Right. And so what I did is normally you could just do this, say, okay, 12 inches from the corner and then six, 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 six feet. But by, by, by doing this and knowing exactly where the studs are, I was able to sort of place them. So I know, um, it wasn't a crazy dimension, like five foot six and seven court, seven eighths, something like that. Um, but it was within code and it only maybe added one or two extra anchor bolts, right? So that you can see there's all the anchor bolts there, anchor bolts there, right? So figured it out in 3d, but then of course I had to make sure that I made a, 
a plan so I can go out there and um, and show the the foundation um, or the concrete uh, guy as well as myself uh, laid it laid it out with him. And so if I open the foundation plan, you can see there's my blue dimensions, blue dimensions of construction, and you can see what I did here. So if I look through this, you know, um, given some dimensions where it comes off, so you can see four inches, then three foot seven, five, four, three. Um, and then same here, right? Five. So, so I'm not just going six, six, six and calling it a day. Um, these are all locations that ideally would be in between stud cavities. Will it work out that way? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, we'll see when we get in the field and you guys will see as well. But I just wanted to show you that there's some benefits to, to actually model this. But of course, there's also benefits to building it um, and knowing or at least being able to say this is where layouts start. Technically, as the architect, you could try and do that. Uh, that might be more of a means and methods thing, but kind of a cool thing. And I can't wait to see if it actually works out the way I'm hoping. So um, if you guys are interested in this model, this Revit model, this project, this residential template, any of the GC uh, general contracting forms and, 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 and data sheets and Excel spreadsheets that I have, um, you can get them um, if you're a member of the BIM After Dark community. So with that, you can head on over to community.bimafterdark.com. You can download this exact Revit file um, with personal data removed uh, and, and and play along with with us as well as check out the template and some of the spreadsheets and so on and so forth. So with that, I'll jump back outside and uh, and we'll close this episode off. So in the next video, what we're going to be doing is waterproofing, foundation drains, backfill, and then we're prepping for slabs. So we're moving, um, hopefully getting ready for framing uh, sooner than later. So thank you for watching episode 11 of the North Wing Project. Say see ya. See ya.